We now look at our good dead friend, Thomas Hobbes, his physics and politics. We looked at him earlier when we talked about ethical egoism, and his background there, of course, remains the same. Uh, he still did. Now, in terms of what shaped his view of politics and ethics, this seems to be primarily have been the fact that he lived during the English Civil War. According to the historical stories, he switched allegiances several times during the course of the conflict, and you know, between the royalist and between the anti-royalist, and apparently he was really bad at his timing, and he would often end up in danger. Uh, in the end, it seems that he uh, was successful because he ended up, you know, not being executed. So, what conclusions did he draw from the experience during this conflict? He drew essentially the following: first, if there is not a stable government, then there is chaos. Secondly, chaos is to be avoided at all costs. And lastly, the only way to prevent chaos is by having a strong government. And this is based on his empirical observations, and because, and also his theory, of course, because as we saw earlier, Thomas Hobbes uh, was an empiricist. His method is one that was fairly common during the time period that Hobbes was Hobbesing, known as the modern era of philosophy. And as I've noted before, the kind of the naming of it as the modern era is somewhat confusing today because we think of like now as being modern, but we're in the postmodern. And postmodern is often presented as an insult, you know, or some or you know derogatory sort of uh, you know, phrase, but it just means essentially the time period after the modern era, which is now, because you had the ancient, you know, medieval, modern, and now we're postmodern. This is not terribly well thought through because once you get past the postmodern, we'll come with something else like post postmodern or something. So, what's his methodology during that he uses? Well, again, it's something fairly commonly used during the time period that he was uh, the modern era when he was Hobbesing. It's also used by thinkers like Descartes. So, he wants to present an analysis that explains society. And like Descartes, he uses a method that he derived from geometry. You might wonder why geometry? Well, one feature of geometry is that you can do geometric proofs, and these would begin with a set of indubitable axioms, and then you can deduce theorems from them. A short version is tying back into our inductive deductive logic distinction. Geometric reasoning of this type would be deductive logic. And so if you essentially if you have premises that you know are true, you know, indubitable premises, and you use deductive logic that's valid, you can deduce deductively a conclusion that must be true. Because that's a feature of a sound argument, valid plus all true premises. In the case of his concern about politics, he believed that he could start with axioms about human nature that were indubitable, but of course they can be dubited <laughs> and that they can be doubted. And then he deduces theorems from them. And the use of this methodology was typically chosen in the hopes of getting a high degree of confidence and ideally what Descartes was looking for, certainty. So in terms of, is he trying to give an historical account? Like, is this what really, really happened, you know, way back in, you know, the before times? And his goal is not that. He's not coming forth and saying, look, I've discovered, you know, the history of how this actually went down. Rather, his goal is to look at how you would justify government in terms of what he takes to be the laws of human nature, and he believes there are such laws, and what sort of government would be rational. So that's his goal and his methodology. A bit more on that, looking at people. So he's looking at people, and he was critical of other previous thinkers, such as you know Aristotle, etc., who didn't take this empirical approach. So he looks at human qualities, our faculties, our capabilities, you know, our strength, experience, reason, and passion. And so part of his purpose here is to look at people, to see what kind of inclinations we have towards each other, naturally, and to examine if we are born apt or fit for society, that whether we're naturally social or not. Aristotle claimed that we were naturally social animals, in his discussion of politics and ethics, and 
Hobbes, uh, like a spoiler, says we're not. But he also wants to see how we would preserve ourselves against mutual violence and to show the conditions in which we could have peace among humans. And he also wants to look at the what he regards as the fundamental laws of nature. During this time period, thinkers, you know, because science was getting into the form we would recognize today, and he had people like Galileo and Newton, etc., laying out what they believed to be the laws of nature. And the belief was you could apply the same sort of scientific approach to humans, which today sounds perfectly, you know, normal and reasonable and hardly shocking. But in that time period was fairly innovative because there was an assumption humans were special and because of our, you know, having souls or divine nature or something that we were outside of the, the normal, the normal realm of natural laws. So he looks at, without naming them, because footnotes and stuff was not, uh, not super big back then, he looks at what he thinks other thinkers thought. So, and he's referencing most likely people like Aristotle, etc., who take the view or took the view since they're dead, that people are born naturally social. And he says the Greeks based their doctrine upon this, but there was considerable disagreement, obviously, among Greek philosophers. But if we look at Aristotle, the idea essentially is that people are naturally social. And he thinks that the his sort of oversimplified view of you know, Greek political philosophy is that all that is required for peace and government is that people make covenants, make agreements, and we call these laws. And he thinks that most people believe this, but they're wrong because they don't understand human nature. But he, of course, does. Now we can look back at the Ring of Gyges where Glaucon presents an analysis of justice, which sounds quite similar to, to Hobbes. So essentially people are compelled, as we'll see, spoilers, I guess, that people are compelled to keep to their agreements out of weakness. And so that would be an ancient Greek who would, would seem to agree with what Hobbes later says. So he looks at the question of why do people get together socially? And he borrows, you know, some concepts from Aristotle here because he was a you know, dominant philosopher for quite a long time. And his concepts were still in use, still in use today, actually, in some respects. So he claims that men come together by accident, not necessity. Now, accident in this case doesn't mean that, you know, two people are running through the, <laughs> through the woods and collide with each other, you know, by a literal accident. What he means by accident is it's more a matter of, you know, chance, that it's not something that must happen. It's something that is just not, not a matter of must, but a matter of maybe. Uh, to compare it to something else, think, for example, my usual example is triangles. By necessity, triangles must have three sides because if they don't, not triangles. As a matter of accident, they can be any, you know, any size or, or color. It's not essential to being tri a triangle that it be a particular color or a particular size. You can have like big triangle, small triangle, blue triangle, sad triangle, etc. So he thinks that it's not a matter of that we, as humans, that by law, you know, by necessity, that it cannot be the case that we did not, you know, form society. It's essentially a matter of randomness. And by necessity doesn't mean that we form society because we, we need to, like in the sense that food and shelter are necessities, but in the sense that we could not do otherwise. Now, some thinkers, like our good dead friend Confucius, believe people were kind of like naturally good and, you know, uh, care for each other. And Hobbes considers this you know, considers what if by nature men loved one another as men, like we just loved people because they were people. And he says, what would, you, what would you expect? Well, we'd expect that we would equally love everybody as being equally, you know, human. So everyone would love everybody equally. And we wouldn't prefer any particular person. We would not prefer those providing honor, but kind of a kind of an outdated term perhaps today, but we may think of it in terms kind of perhaps uh, inaccurately, but today we might say, you know, like fame or being praised. And of course, profit. Now, Hobbes thinks that as a matter of fact, we have these preferences that we don't, it's not that anybody will do because everyone's equally human and we love all people equally. We have clear preferences. 
And this is, of course, an empirical question. So you the question to ask yourself, is this true? Is it that you love everybody equally or do you have preferences? So he claims that the reason we seek society is not for the sake of society, not for its own sake, but for some form of gain by honor or profit. And again, this is an empirical matter. And so this is something we'd want to look at to see if it's actually true or not. So then, according to Hobbes, why do people get together if it's not because of, you know, love of each other? Well, his answer is essentially he's going to do it with an empirical experiment. He's not going to just, you know, sit down and think about, you know, what people might do. He claims he's going to observe people and look at, you know, look at what people actually do. And this allows for if you want to dispute him, he could provide like an empirical, you know, counter to him, make observations and see why people do what they do. So in the first case, he considers traffic. Now, he doesn't mean like driving around in cars. Uh, nowadays, when we talk about traffic, we usually mean something like negative. We talk about like human trafficking or drug trafficking, but it comes from essentially, you know, trade or economic activity. So it didn't when Hobbes is using it, he's not, you know, referring to things like drug travel, although it could be, but not necessarily referring to what we think of as like always, you know, kind of bad things. And he says essentially in business, when people get together, their main concern is business, not, you know, not other people, uh, not out of like the love of other people, but because of business. So like an everyday example, if you go to buy groceries uh, and you're interacting with the cashier, you're most likely not there to be become friends with them. You're there to buy groceries. I mean, there can be obvious, obvious exceptions you might think of if someone has like a special interest in that cashier. But in general, we're just there, you know, the business of business is business. And in the case of, um, you know, offices, uh, in that case, he thinks you may form what he calls like a market friendship, like, you know, transactional relationship. But he thinks that this is a, a negative thing, that it's more jealousy than love. So essentially, he's got a what we consider a pretty negative view of why people get together in the sense that we're not there for love, we're there for essentially gain. So he thinks that out of this, you might get factions in, dis in disagreement, but never goodwill. Now, at this point, you may think, well, Okay, obviously, if you're getting together for, you know, business, it's about business. If you're getting together for, like, you know, for office, uh, then that would be also, you know, essentially like politics. But what about when you get together with your friends for recreation? Well, he presents a pretty negative view. And you may think, well, perhaps he didn't have any really good friends. So maybe he has this view because, you know, a psychological explanation because he didn't have good friends. But this is something we can examine ourselves empirically. We can think of our own friendships and see interactions with people and to see if he's right. So he claims this. When people get together for recreation, what pleases people the most is what stirs up laughter. And what he means is not like listening to a comedian necessarily or watching like a funny movie. He essentially means that mocking other people. So what he claims we do is that we compare ourselves to other people's defects and thus improve our self-opinion that, you know, it, they're essentially there to puff ourselves up, so to speak, to, you know, make ourselves feel better. So our concern is not with the society of being with our friends, but our own glory, basically, you know, our, our pride. He also claims that we wound the absent. As I say, if someone's not there, we'll start talking <laughs> talking negatively about them, you know, gossiping about them, etc. <clears throat> then he turns to the matter of recreation when we start telling, you know, stories. Like the common thing when, when friends get together is they, they tell stories of what they've done. And what he claims, again, this is an empirical matter. You can check this yourself. He claims that if a person starts talking about themselves, what other people want to talk about is, of course, themselves. And so they might they might listen a bit, or not even listen, but pretend to listen for a bit because they're waiting to tell their own story. And so if a person tells 
of a wonder, the rest tell of miracles. And what he means by this is essentially each person tries to top the previous you know, story to make themselves look even better, or so he claims. And again, this is an empirical matter. You, this is what he claims to have experienced. And we can look at our own experience to see if they match what he claims. Also today, of course, we have access to psychological studies about friendship, and we can look at the factual question of, does he have people right? So then why do people you know, get together? Well, for him, the answers are you know, from two things. One is from poverty, which is not, not in the sense we're like in crushing poverty, et cetera, but in the sense that we, we want to gain something. Or what he calls vain glory. That is essentially we want people, we want to you know, puff ourselves up, so to speak, uh, to increase our self-opinion, our self-standing, our status. So we, we want to essentially boil it down. We, we want to get something out of the interaction. We're not there for friendship. We're there for gain, or so we can, so he claims. So then from all this, given what he thinks people are like, why, why do we form society, according to him? Well, his answer is this. We're looking to get what we think of as what's good for us. And his view of people is that what we regard as good is based on what is pleasant to us. Either, you know, pleasant to our senses, you know, it'd be something like, you know, think of like good food, you know, tastes good or pleasant to our mind. It's pleasing to us. And he thinks that in the case of the mind, its pleasure is what he calls glory. Uh, again, kind of an, an old, older term that's not in a great deal of use today, but for him, it means that you want, each of us wants to have a good opinion of ourselves. We want to think a lot of ourselves. And what he calls the sensual or conveniences, basically things that we find, you know, enjoyable uh, or convenient that make things easier. So then he claims this is our motivation to form society. The two things. One is gain. The other is what he calls glory, which is, again, basically to get something, you know, it could be, you know, things like material gains, money, etc., or this sort of opinion of ourselves, you know, but sort of to get this, today we might say like to gain fame and praise. So it's not out of love of other people, it's out of self-love. And he claims in terms of what is it that really makes society possible, well, if they're only, according to him, if there's only two things that motivate us, gaining stuff or this glory, then those can, those are the only two possible options. So what about, you know, vain glory? Well, he claims that can't, that can't work. Why not? Well, the reason why is that because taking, you know, to, to make it clear in modern terms, think of vain glory as being famous. So could you have a society based on fame? Is that, you know, in terms of what people can get out of it? And the answer is no, uh, because we, fame is something that if everyone's got it, in effect, no one does because fame is a matter of comparison. Uh, everyone can't be famous, you know, because if everyone is famous, then in a sense, no one is. So in order for there to be fame, there's got to be some people who aren't famous. So what would make Taylor Swift, you know, special and famous is that you know, everyone knows, almost everyone knows who she is. And that's something special about her because for the rest of us, very few people know who we are. And of course, being around other people by itself doesn't give you this, this fame. And again, everyone can't be famous. So society has to be something that we all can get something out of, our motivation. Now you could say, well, think about like when people go, in modern terms, people go onto YouTube or TikTok and they're there to maybe try to become famous, but they just don't achieve it. And so one could counter Hobbes here saying, well, maybe people you know, go and try and that's a motivation. But he focuses more on what people will get out of it. And he claims the thing we'll get out of it is gain. So then why society? Well, he considers this motivation of gain. And he claims that <clears throat> what people realize is this. Although mutual help is beneficial, you get more by dominion, basically ruling over others. And he claims, kind of similar to uh, what Gyges, um, what Glaucon 
talked about in the Ring of Gajis, is that people naturally, if they if fear were, were taken away, if they didn't have to be afraid of you know failure, etc., people would rather obtain dominion than gain society. Roughly put, we'd rather be ruling over other people without cooperating with them because he thinks you know dominion is better than society. But much as uh, Glocon said, we settle for society because you know out of fear that we can't can't get away with it. So then, how do we form this society? So for Hobbes, the starting point, the origin of any society that's going to be great and lasting, lasting for him does not lie in a mutual goodwill that people have towards each other because we don't, according to him, have any of that. So if there's no mutual goodwill, what is it then that you know, motivates us to form these societies? And his answer is somewhat oddly enough, mutual fear. And what is the cause of this fear? Well, he claims that the basis of the fear involves essentially two factors. First, he claims we're naturally equal. And this, as we'll see for him, is not like we typically think today of like a nice form of equality. This is a pretty brutal view of equality. And he claims the second part is, is that in addition to being equal, we also have a will to hurt each other. And that does make sense in terms of creating fear because if we're equal to each other and we we're willing to hurt each other, that means, you know, essentially everyone's equally a threat to anyone else. And that would seem to be a pretty good basis for fear, knowing that all around you are other people that are you know, equivalent to you, but also want to hurt you. So what is this, this equality? Well, today we we often think of, at least people who aren't like racist and sexist, etc. Uh, we generally think of equality as a as a good thing. We you know praise it. Uh, but for for Hobbes, he takes a pretty harsh view of equality. So it's not like oh we're all equal because we're all created by God or we're all equal because you know no one's better, no one's like superior to no one else. It's essentially this. As living creatures, we're all so vulnerable that anybody can kill anybody. So, as I said, a pretty brutal, harsh view of equality. Not a nice equality, but, uh, you know, you're equal to anybody because you can kill anybody and anybody can kill you. And because of this, people should not, according to Hobbes, see themselves as naturally above anybody else because anybody can kill anyone. And his reasoning is that people are equals if they can do equal things against each other. And he claims in some reason you might, you might question that if you can do the greatest thing and he takes that to be kill, then we can do equal things. So he claims by nature, everyone is equal because anybody can kill anybody. And of course there's the ways to, to question this. One of course would be, looked at factually, is this, you know, is he right about this? Anybody can kill anybody. And then of course, there's also kind of the, the you know, perhaps a moral assessment of, is this what we mean by, by equality? And he claims the inequality we have now arises from civil law. So again, this is a very harsh view of equality. So that's the equality. Anybody can kill anybody. We're all equal. Will to hurt. So what is the will to hurt? Why do we have it? Well, he claims in the state of nature, and again, Hobbes is a state of nature theorist, and that he creates hypothetically a state in which there's no government, no authority, no laws of, created by people. And so what are people like in that state? Well, he claims that everyone has a desire and a will to hurt others, but he is willing to claim that this doesn't come all from the same cause because he does consider essentially two motivations, two diff different motivations for a will to hurt. The first one is, is a, he says, you know, essentially a person who um, permits as much to others as they do to themselves, according to natural equality, and their will to hurt comes from defending themselves. Like they're, you know, for whatever reason, 
uh, are not out to like overtake too much, you know, sort of contrary to what we saw at Glocon say. But of course, they have to defend themselves. So their will to hurt comes from defending what they have against others who would take that for them. The second type that he considers is, is someone who thinks of themselves as above others and wants to do as they wish. And their will to hurt comes from vain glory, basically they're, you know, they're full of themselves, and a false esteem for their strength. Because according to Hobbes, no one in the state of nature is strong enough to get away with this because we're all, you know, we're all equal because anybody can kill anybody. So two motivations to hurt. One is the person who wants to take from others, who sees themselves as, you know, uh, powerful enough to do this and wanting to do it. And then those who have a, at least according to Hobbes, the correct assessment that all people are equal, but they're willing to hurt others to defend themselves. So we get the will to hurt, according to, to him. Now, again, this is an empirical claim about human beings. And is he right about that? Do we want to hurt other people? You know, are we willing to do it? And are these our motivations? So the troubles arise because one question might be is why then do we have this conflict in, in the state of nature? And for Hobbes, as we'll see compared to Locke, the state of nature is pretty, pretty awful. So he considers first the combat of wits. This essentially is for him, not like a de debate uh, type of scenario, uh, but it's a, a battle over ideas. Essentially, this could be, this could be um, political ideas, religious ideas, philo even philosophic ideas. So why does this cause so much trouble? Well, one reason he probably thinks this is because his experience was the English Civil War, and so that's a conflict over, you know, these conceptions about, uh, you know, politics and religion. And so it makes sense that the battle is over ideas. And he thinks, and again, he's doing sort of a psychological analysis of people. He, and this can be, can be questioned, uh, criticized, examined, etc. He claims that we see if someone, you know, doesn't agree with us, agree with our opinions and, and views, then we see this as something, you know, bad and, and unpleasant. We, we take issue with this. And we even think that if someone doesn't approve of us, of our views, our, you know, our values and thoughts, then we see this as being to tacitly accuse us of being wrong. So a mere failure to agree is essentially the person is silently, you know, saying that we're wrong. And to disagree, we see is it's like being called a fool. So there's essentially is like a pretty harsh escalation that even you know a failure to approve of, of our views is on par with you know saying we're wrong, and to say we're wrong is on par with calling us you know a fool. So I'm not going to only imagine that what you know calling someone a fool would be would be like. Now, based on his experience, it's not surprising that he concludes that. The wars that are the most violent, you know, the sharpest, are between, you know, factions of the same religion and factions of the same commonwealth. Essentially, you know, uh, in the case of the commonwealth, the civil war, in the case of religion, like an, an, an interior battle between sects of the same the same faith. And again, this is an empirical question. You could you could examine data like of looking at the number of people, you know killed relative to the participants. You could do like an assessment of the brutality of the, the fighting, etc. But it does seem to have a plausible case here. Civil wars and factional disputes tend to be pretty brutal. So he, what motivates in, us in this is he thinks that, again, this is psychology is doing, that what we enjoy is finding something in which we can, you know, win and we can elevate ourselves. <clears throat> so when, when it comes to others, we will, you know, declare scorn towards them, you know, in our contempt by laughter, words, gestures, or signs. And of course, if this is done to us, he claims this creates a great vexation. We really hate that. And so that gives a great desire to hurt. So that's what we're saying is we've got a lot of pride. And if people don't agree with us or disagree with us, that's going to make us very angry, or so we claims. Again, empirical claim, 
you can go based on your own experience, look at some psychological research to see if this, if this is plausible or not. So in addition to the fights over ideas, basically we'd have like YouTube battles uh, today or political disputes. There's also what he considers what is a very common desire, you know, cause of the desire to hurt. And that is essentially over stuff that many people desire the same thing at the same time and either they cannot or will not share it or divide it. A good example would be, you know, land. We have, as some, this is being recorded, multiple you know, wars and conflicts going on, as always. And probably the, the ones that are making you know, the news are right now are the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And of course, Russia wants Ukraine's land and is in claiming it's their, their own or some such thing. And they're there invading you know, Ukraine. We also have in the Middle East conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, a battle there as well, because they, you know, in both cases, people are either cannot or are unwilling to share or divide uh, the, you know, the land, the power, etc. So Hobb seems right about that. It also, of course, occurs on a you know smaller, perhaps less violent scale when it comes to you know competition or conflict over getting something like a job or you know uh, buying a house. And of course, we generally don't resort to violence so much when disputes over jobs and houses, but this does create you know, a desire to, to hurt and dislike. So how are, these, are, how are these settled? Well, Hobbes just lays it out as the strongest you know, gets it. How do you decide that? Well, it's decided by the sword. So this is what leads us into the brutal state of nature as Hobbes sees it. We're equal we have desire to hurt, and this leads us into conflict. So next, we'll take a look at, in part two, look at how we can, at least according to Hobbes, perhaps get out of this. So stay safe, and I'll see you in the future.